actual reaction to a, a, a phenomenon, which is that citizens are capturing each time more uh, agents with their smartphone, so in particular, um, their interaction with the police. But no later than uh, two weeks ago, um, you, you could see uh, during, in Paris, uh, you could someone film the terrorists uh, leaving from uh, Charlie Hebdo, and um, you could see how um, uh, these terrorists showed the police car that was trying to uh, stop them, and how the police car has to drive back and uh, let them go. So that's an example. Um, other example of uh, recordings are uh, direct interaction between police and citizens. So this, is, uh, this was the case, for instance, in the UK, with the Mark Duggan case. Uh, Mark du Duggan was a um, presumed criminal. Uh, and during uh, a pre plan operation of the police, he was shot and died. The problem was that someone filmed uh, the events, and the images showed that uh, Mark Duggan at that time uh, was not carrying any weapon at all. Um, so um, this uh, sparked uh, riots in the neighborhood, and this also um, led Duggan's family to accuse the police of executing him. Uh, in other situations, uh, the problem that you have no record of the event that was happened, for instance, this summer uh, in the U.S. Uh, in Ferguson, uh, 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 the police shot a young man during a routine control, and there was no video camera to record the event. Uh, no one uh, using the smartphone to uh, film the event. In that case, it's very difficult to establish the truth about what has happened. Was the use of the force legitimate or not? Um, people tend to, to feel it's, um, well, this sparked a lot of riots as you've seen in the news. And when the, the court decided to release the policeman with no charges, uh, people felt it was very unfair. So um, this technology has, um, is meant to serve as accountability mechanism to control police. And it's visible it's something good because it reduces uh, violence. Still, it raises a, a, a number of concerns. First, with regard to the effectiveness of their use as accountability mechanism, um, to what extent can it be used as evidence? And also, um, to what extent interaction between police and the public should be recorded? Should it be always on or not? Uh, it also raised question about the impact on privacy of citizens, but also of policemen. For the, the same reason, uh, we can record the audio. Uh, you can also, um, the, 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 the image are so close that you can use facial recognition uh, technology uh, very easily. And finally, it also raised question with regard to the added value of this mechanism to just find uh, the truth, the fact that only one part uh, of the event has been recorded and uh, it's present only one side of, of the story. So this one does not intend to uh, give an answer to all these questions, but um, to, to give some element of res uh, response and to uh, deal with, um, with the question we'll use the uh, approach we use in the Paris project um, to assess the legitimacy and proportionality of surveillance technology. So in this uh, uh, project, uh, we aim at designing tools to support such assessment. Uh, one essential aspect of the approach we have adopted in Paris is to take into account the views of the different stakeholders affected by uh, the technology. So today, I uh, will hear the views of technology providers, of civil society, and of uh, social and ethical uh, experts. It would have been good to have someone from police to hear what they have to say, but unfortunately they are not very eager to, uh, to come to this kind of conference. So today we have uh, four speakers. Uh, we start with uh, Mathilde Bossier, Bossier, who is Product and Office Support Manager of Thales. He will give us an overview of the new technical possibility linked to the recent uh, miniaturization and spread of uh, video sensors and their use by police. Then Jay Stanley, who is a senior policy analyst at ICLU, will put this technology in context and tell us about the experience in the US, uh, the role of police body cameras in specific illustrative events, and uh, the policy adopted by police department and the problem uh, they raise. Then Daniel Lemetayer, who is head of uh, the project lab Capris at INRIA, will uh, talk about the differences between mobile and fixed camera and the different kind of safeguard uh, they call. And it 
could also talk about uh, the risk link uh, to the potential demand from society for the use of body cameras in other fields, by other profession, uh, profession, not only by policemen. And finally, um, Nathalie Grandjean, head of the unit uh, Technology and Society at Fritz, uh, will give us a viewpoint of the philosopher and um, will uh, explain us the issue linked to the use of body cameras as a source of production of the uh, truth. So let's start with uh, Matthias uh, Bossier. So as I said, it's a product that offers a supermarket in Dallas and supports international business development actions, offers a program within the domain of security supervision. <coughs> it's graduated from the French National High School in Physics from Marseille. Nice to meet you. So on Dallas, we deliver uh, some systems, some systems all over the world. And in winning this slide, uh, I aim just as providing uh, facts, simple facts, about state of the art, about, uh, ah. uh, about uh, this, is, um, this is a mess because I got many uh, photos there. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, can you exit the decorum? start talking and whenever you want to play the I'm trying to take my gun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to resist the rest. 
though um, it would make sense to frame this discussion around a real, a real incident where video that was dash cam video in a vehicle, obviously not body camera, but the principle is the same. Um, you know, completely had a turnaround here. Here we have an individual who was facing time in prison. I hope you could hear the, the audio, but he was facing time in prison. And once the second video emerged, which they hadn't turned over to prosecutors in the second uh, police car, charges against him were dropped, and, and two police officers ended up facing charges themselves. Um, and there have been other uh, cases like that um, around the country, um, especially with regards to um, to either bystander video or uh, dash camera video. The, the, the body cameras are still so new, although there was an incident in Albuquerque where police shot an unarmed, mentally ill man who was about, they were surrounding him, he was about 30 feet away, and they shot him in the back, and it did lead to uh, large protests in Albuquerque. It led to the federal government stepping in um, and um, carrying out oversight over the, um, over the police department and a whole federal investigation and so forth. So, uh, and then on the other hand, there was an incident in uh, Daytona Beach, Florida, where there was a backlash from the community after a police officer shot and killed a former NFL football star, Jermaine Green, six times in November 2013. Uh, and then later on, video emerged and showed that Green was trying to stab his girlfriend and was holding her hostage uh, just before police opened fire. And once that video emerged, the police were exonerated from, uh, from the suspicions that surrounded their action. Um, and we had, of course, the, um, the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, and then later we had Eric Garner death that was, that was captured on video. And um, I think in the United States, sentiment after the Ferguson emerged and there was no video of it, um, everybody suddenly, and, and we had, we had um, I had been getting press calls about, uh, uh, calls from our affiliates about body cameras since about 2010, 2011. I wrote a report in 2000. 13 about it, and then Ferguson happened in 2014. Suddenly, the whole world said, we need body cameras. It's the solution to all these problems. Um, and people really thought it was going to be a silver bullet that was going to solve everything. And then the Eric Garner case in New York happened, where an individual was restrained by police. They used an illegal chokehold on him. He died. Um, and as in Ferguson, the local prosecutor, uh, a grand jury, declined to charge the officer. Here we had an officer using an illegal chokehold, and the suspect died. He was selling illegal cigarettes on the sidewalk, you know, and, and there were no charges. And so at that point, sentiment swung in the opposite direction, and everybody said, well, body cameras are useless, because even when you get egregious misconduct on tape, um, you, you, can't get a, um, you can't get a prosecution. And of course, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, body cameras don't solve every problem with our, with our criminal justice system, but it does make a difference. Uh, people in, are still arguing about what took place in Ferguson, but are not arguing about what took place with the Eric Garner case. Um, in December, uh, President Obama issued a proposal for $75 million of federal matching money um, for body cameras. He did not actually call for them to be used with the Border Patrol, which is the Federal Border Patrol, where there's been an enormous amount of abuses, and we are currently agitating for them to be used there. There are no good statistics in the US for how widespread body camera adoption is, um, but uh, it, it appears that about a quarter of the uh, 17,000 police agencies in the United States are using them so far. Um, and uh, a recent survey found that about 80% uh, of the departments are currently evaluating them. So this technology is spreading very, very quickly in the United States. Um, and we, ha we do have a very large problem with um, police violence. According to one count, there are about 400 justifiable homicides each year by police uh, in the United States. There were 461 last year, but those numbers are only um, com compiled by the FBI from voluntarily submitted data from these 17,000 law enforcement agencies. Uh, and only 750 uh, submitted data, maybe the ones who had justifiable homicides submit the data, um, but it doesn't include unjustifiable um, uh, homicides, and it doesn't include non-fatal shootings. It wouldn't have included uh, the case that we saw on camera here. It, it wouldn't include other cases of assault and so forth. Um, uh, attempts by journalists to compile more comprehensive statistics suggest there are about 1,000 police killings a year in the United States. Um, about a quarter of them involve a white officer killing a black person. There's definitely a racial um, component here. 
and there's no way of knowing how many how many of the victims like Michael Brown were unarmed and how many were not. Uh, in 2011, when the FBI reported 400 um, uh, justifiable law enforcement homicides in the U.S., police killed six people in Australia, two in England, and six in Germany. Uh, so. The, the proportion of violence is significantly higher in the United States. Um, so, uh, we, you know, the ACLU has always been against surveillance and public video surveillance, government surveillance of individuals, and yet we surprised many people in the United States when we supported with caveats uh, police body cameras. We think that they, that the oversight potential that they have as seen by a video like this is so significant and the problem of police violence in the United States is so significant that we, uh, that, that the right, that in the end, it is a judgment call. You might reach a different conclusion if your problem of police violence is lower or uh, if, if the privacy implications are higher, but we, in our judgment, it makes sense to do it. Um, with, with, provided that the cameras have good protections for privacy and good policies in place to ensure that they are not manipulated by the police officers. And those are the three biggest issues with the cameras. Manipulation or control by officers, uh, privacy, and, the open, and open records, which is related to privacy. Um, the, the United States has a federal open records law called FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. The states all have their state equivalents, open records laws, and they vary state to state, and they vary, they vary widely. Now, and the police video is subject to these state FOIA laws. Um, in some states, such as Washington State and Min Minnesota and, and others, all the video collected by all the cameras the police are wearing are public records, are, are considered public records, and can be accessed by a journalist or a citizen or anybody else. And this is a big problem for privacy, obviously, because you know, a lot of, at least in the United States, a high proportion of police calls are domestic violence. Police are going into people's homes, they're seeing victims in, in, in the worst moments of their lives. That is not video that should be released to the public or to the media. Uh, so that's a, that's a problem. Um, and and that, that video needs to be very, very uh, closely contained. So we proposed in our October 2013 white paper a set of policies that would protect privacy um, while allowing uh, the video cameras to be um, to be have the maximum oversight potential that they can have. It's very hard, however, to figure out what's actually happening with the police policies and the police cameras that are being deployed in, in these thousands of police departments and sheriff's departments and county uh, police and municipal police departments all around the United States. Um, we, uh, in our original paper, we called for the, we were most worried that the police would manipulate the video by turning the cameras on and off uh, so that uh, they would capture what they wanted to capture and, and not capture uh, any abuse that they wanted to engage in. So we called them to record uh, all encounters with the public and that 90% of that video would be stored for a certain period of time in case somebody filed a complaint against the police officer, but never really viewed by human eyes unless it's flagged because there's been a complaint against the police officer or it contains evidence of a crime. But very few of the police officers, police departments that we're seeing around the country are actually following a policy like that. They're giving quite broad discretion to police officers as to when to turn the cameras on and when to turn them off. Um, some of the policies are, are, are fairly strong. They say that any time a police officer engages in a call for service or engages in any kind of investigatory or um, enforcement action, the cameras are expected to be on. Um, uh, and, and I think that that's language that's understood pretty well by police officers around the country and, and, sh and should, in theory, force them to capture anything that's likely to become a dramatic situation. Um, but we're still very worried about discretion. And the consequences for police officers that don't follow that policy are unclear and they vary. There have been departments where there have been shootings by officers who have been issued body cameras and the footage, body cameras or the footage disappears and there have been no consequences to the officers. This happened in Albuquerque, which has a particularly poisonous police department. Um, 
Uh, and then there have been others where police officers have claimed that the, that the, that the video malfunctioned and they went in and looked at the, uh, the audit logs and found that it was actually manly, manually turned off and the police officers had been fired. Um, there are, uh, there are so, so right now it's, it's kind of a wild west. There are all these departments. A lot of them are, are, are considering using them. Some are using them. Some of them have policies. Some of them have no policies. We are working to push good policies on departments around the country. Most of the large police departments in the United States have not yet started using them. They are now experimenting with them. Um, most of the departments that are using them are the smaller ones. Um, but they are, in the, some of them are working with us and other community departments to try and come up with policies that we think will, will, will serve our ends. Um, but others are, are refuse to release their policies and won't even make them public, which is uh, r ridiculous. So um, there are a few other side issues. One of them is, that we're seeing increasingly crop up around the country is the question of if a police officer engages in a shooting or other high level violence uh, and goes to write up his or her account of what happened, usually it's his uh, account of what happened, does the officer get to view the video before writing their account? Um, and most of the police departments are saying yes, the officer can view the video before the account. And we are arguing that that's a bad idea, that it will enable lying, it will enable cross contamination of evidence. Um, the officer's memory and what the video shows may be different and may record different things, both of which are parts of the truth. And if you let the officer view the video, it, it contaminates the, um, the video. So, uh, you know, we, in, in our white paper, we engage in a lot of the policy questions. We try and, and provide preliminary answers um, over control over recordings, protecting privacy, retention policies, public disclosure policies, um, notice, recording in the home, and police access to videos. Uh, I won't go into all of that now, but we can discuss it. Um, but it's it's very much a wild west, and, and everybody's trying to figure out what the best policies are. It's still in flux. We're seeing how the cameras actually operate on the ground, as opposed to theory. Um, and it's 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 certainly an interesting and dramatic process. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, it is almost eleven o'clock, so we have forty-five minutes for. Uh, other presentations for the book for and and debate with the audience. So I would, I would, yeah, I would like to ask you to keep your presentations short. Um, so the next presentation is, I think, the one uh, of Matthias. Uh, what we um, uh, understand from Jay is that that uh, that the, the series of events that are difficult. Debate in the United States, um, and uh, and that uh, you have written a, a white paper. Is it clear where we can find this this white paper? Is it somewhere? Is it on the on the web? If you search ACLU body cameras, police body cameras, it will come right up. ACLU body cameras. You Google it, and automatically you will find your Yes, please. Thank you. So. Um, I'm coming to technology and to capacity, cap capability of technology regarding uh, mobile video devices and with, with a focus for state of the art um, about police body cameras. Very simply, uh, what I'd like to underline is that um, the capabilities, the very new capabilities that spread very recently, that have, have, been, have been made available very recently, uh, come both from a technological push, this not a request from operational, from uh, public and so on before, uh, and, and or, uh, smarter or um, uh, more efficient video devices, it really comes from technological capabilities. And we are faced with the use of these new technological capabilities. Um, this comes from miniaturization of uh, video devices uh, and also banalization. Uh, when, as a market provider, an uh, interest of systems of surveillance, what we could say is that we push ourselves, we push uh, the, um, this kind of, uh, of devices, but um, the main driver remains the uh, mass market. Uh, if you add uh, a mass market of uh, smartphones, uh, things like this, uh, you won't have um, a price decrease uh, sufficient 
for, uh, for it to be, for this kind of devices to be used uh, within um, a floor, within a glass, uh, within a tie, within a watch. You know that uh, with uh, new watches uh, for uh, spooks, uh, you will have uh, in some, some cameras enabling you to film, enabling you to take photos and stuff. So if you have very interesting things, you can put this to everywhere from uh, UAV, take pictures uh, at a very, very affordable price. So this is a technological push. Two types of uh, usage are uh, possible with um, the, uh, the devices which are wearable or which are uh, fly, uh, which are flying and so on. You get uh, basically the recording uh, in, in house within the device, and you get uh, the real time transmission of the video. And this is very different from an operational uh, point of view and capabilities, and also privacy um, um, and privacy risks. Uh, is that when you get uh, local recording, you will have um, uh, some review of the videos and possibly uh, diffusion over, over uh, the internet uh, with um, good reason or not. Um, only offline, after the events uh, uh, occur. Whereas in some offers you may have capabilities for so Wi-Fi, three generation uh, networks and, and so on, capability to, um, to show it real time, summarize. Fanny was talking about uh, face recognition. We have to notice that face recognition makes sense mainly when you get real time um, sending of the, of the video uh, to a device capable of performing face recognition. To be, to be true, most of the devices uh, and, uh, which are um, available now um, works in the left, um, left uh, way, meaning that they do record within the device. Meaning that uh, advanced capabilities such as face recognition and so on, from a technological point of view, are not available. Um, here you, you will have very quickly, because uh, we got some specialists uh, of this, uh, I can call it Jeff, who, uh, Jeff, sorry, who um, talk about uh, the case of United States. Globally speaking, in France and United States, you get body cameras on the, on the body of, uh, of the, of the car. Um, the big difference is that uh, in France, this is the choice of the cop really, uh, that um, and he, he will have to state orally uh, to, uh, to the suspect, to the people around him, that he is uh, triggering the recording of the video. Whereas my understanding is that in the United States, much more continuous uh, and less choice of the policeman to, uh, to report. And from a technological point of view, uh, um, What is sure is that in those cases, this is recorded locally, even if in the United States there is a program, innovation program, including <coughs> the video within the car, but not with uh, the aim of uh, watching live. It is a, a way to, to, to push in, uh, more easily the video for them to be viewed offline. Um, very quickly, um, this slide, we cannot see the uh, as headlines. Um, the idea there for me was to uh, sketch to you what could happen in the very <coughs> next future about this kind of uh, devices and also about the concept of operation associated with this kind of devices. Because as I said in um, the very first, uh, slide, the very first <coughs> slide, this is a technological push. What happens when you get a technological push is that operational people do have some reflection, also uh, industrials, To, um, to propose the concept of use, to, to um, really to help uh, the best people within their missions. What I could say is that um, we have to remember that this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, wearable device, also in Paris we got some military uh, offers, uh, we have to, to remind that uh, main technical or technological um, advances within civilian uh, usage, usage uh, also come including from the concept of the use from the military side. Because military, to be, to be clear, military has much more uh, capability and money for uh, research. So what you see there is the um, equip, uh, modern equipment of uh, soldiers. Uh, what you will have is augmented reality within the glasses. Uh, what you will have also, very important, is 
compared to the policeman, is um, enhanced capability for transmissions. <coughs> so we have, uh, you will have real-time push of information and absorption of information much more efficient <coughs> compared to the policeman. This could be an axis of, um, of development, of usage, uh, this kind of technology. Also, some people say the police car itself, itself could be the core um, of a mobile um, police office with some transmission, uh, with some face recognition and so on. Uh, last but not least, uh, a slide about counter uh, measures against surveillance, about uh, video surveillance and privacy and technologies. It's not uh, exhaustive, but you got some um, examples of what could be possible. You can detect a camera. Detect a camera is not so simple. Uh, the, um, the physical uh, mean that is used is the type of reflection in the glass of the optics of the camera. So it's not so, so easy, but it's possible. Uh, if you got real time transmission, you get a network. Uh, and what is very often uh, at use for UAVs, for uh, cameras, for transmission, is a volumetry uh, for the localization of the, of the emission. Uh, so it's a detection of the transmission. You could also, this is the subject of this image, uh, use uh, infrared um, uh, powerful uh, emitters uh, that won't be filtered by the camera to just blind, blind it locally. From, from the um, technological point of view, the watermarking and digital right management could be uh, really interesting from accountability point of view. It's not so easy to perform, but you can have, add some um, modification within the image which are not seen, but which sign the source. So you can say wherever you find the image, it comes from the top uh, system. It's not available, but uh, in cinema it's available. And it's kind of also, you can have the very basic uh, encryption capability. I encrypt within the camera, so uh, really uh, monitor who will uh, watch the, who will watch the, the view. Taking into account that this is possible, uh, this won't come uh, as a, the sensor itself from the last one. <coughs> so I hope it was uh, it, it explained uh, to you the state of the art for this kind of uh, excellent, excellent. And I think it gives us a, a very good view on, on what is possible, right? especially uh, if you start with connected body cams <coughs> and you can imagine a policeman body cam, face recognition, I recognize all that, so you can connect to a database, oh, it's a potential terrorist, I can better neutralize him immediately. And so, fantastic possibilities in the future. So it's a, a very important element in the debate. Our next uh, presentation comes from Daniel. And he is... Yes, thanks for the introduction, and just so, uh, I'd like just to focus on uh, police uh, body cams, which is a topic of this panel. Uh, but then I would like to broaden a bit the discussion and open the debate to a uh, longer term uh, perspective. Uh, so, as we have heard from, uh, from, from Jay, I would say there are three main uh, motivations for the introduction of uh, police body cams, coming from different uh, stakeholders. Uh, the first one, of course, is for uh, civil society uh, to increase uh, police accountability. Uh, second one is for police officers themselves to protect themselves from wrong accusations. And uh, for policymakers and for society as a rule, we could say that there is a hope that uh, the use of police body cams would help pacify relations between police and uh, civil society. So, of course, uh, behind all this, as, as you can hear, uh, the key issue is accountability, and accountability <coughs> as a way to increase trust. But there is also this issue of privacy that we discussed today on the dark side uh, of the call. Uh, and uh, I think to, to analyze these values between these different values, uh, as Jay said, there are many factors to be taken into account, and the context is a key feature because it's not the same in all countries, as we've heard. 
and um, the, the type of uh, police misconduct. But the technical aspects that Matthias just uh, described are also very significant. And uh, again, depending on the work on the type of system that we use, the type of features, it can make a big difference. So I think it can be useful to uh, make a, compar a comparison, a comparative analysis uh, between fixed uh, cameras and, uh, and uh, body cams. I think there are at least three main differences, technically speaking, between the two. Uh, the first one is that, as we've heard, uh, body cams, they are not on all the time, which could be a big issue if uh, these officers could just turn on uh, the camera when, when they please. But if not, if strong measures are taken to prevent this, this could be turned into an advantage, into a benefit, in the sense that in comparison with the fixed cameras that we have uh, everywhere today, we could say that body cams, at least they do not impose permanent surveillance. You are under surveillance at specific times in specific places. Uh, but as, as, as um, I said, to be sure that the drawbacks are uh, not overweight, these, these benefits, strong measures have to be taken. Of course, uh, you, you, they must have uh, strong policies to ensure that um, all interactions with the public are recorded, and also no possibility to delete, to edit, as, as, as Jay mentioned before. And I think also there should be strong accountability measures to ensure that these policies are actually implemented because otherwise these uh, deterrent effects that we hope uh, would, would, would not play. Uh, the next uh, big difference is the fact that uh, um, uh, police body cams can record not only <coughs> detailed uh, images but also uh, the sound which again could be seen as a further risk uh, in terms of privacy, but also benefit in terms of evidence, because you would have uh, more precise evidence. Uh, in terms of privacy, I think one of the features uh, that uh, should be um, forbidden in this case is automatic face recognition, which could become feasible or more easily feasible uh, because of the quality of the level of detail of the cameras. But then, I think it would be uh, diverting uh, the very purpose of the, the, the police vehicles. Again, that should be strong measures to ensure that the right people get access to the, to the video and, and so on. And the third main difference is the fact that, of course, by definition, uh, body cams uh, are mobile. So they can be used in places which are out of reach of fixed cameras. So in particular in, in, in private uh, premises, in the cold and so on. So of course it should be prevented or only with the explicit consent of the people or maybe in, in very extreme situations. And if it's the case, again, you could say that uh, in comparison with fixed cameras, if you think of uh, the cameras that we have everywhere today in most cities, in which you are filmed, you are recorded uh, all the time, in all your journeys, without even noticing it anymore, you could say that a, a, a body cam, if there is a clear notice, if there is a clear sign of the uniform, um, maybe a, a, a light, a flashing light, at least you would know when you are filmed, so it will also be a um, uh, uh, benefit. So, altogether, I think that I would, I would, uh, this comparison leads uh, more or less to the same conclusions as the ACLU report that uh, we mentioned before. <coughs> if the right measures are taken, uh, body cams could be, could be a, a, a window. But uh, I would like to make at least two comments here. Well, the first one is that uh, and I think that Natalie is going to say more about this, the fact that there shouldn't be uh, any other uh, reliance on the technology either, because even if they are on the side, even if they get the sound, uh, pictures are always taken from a particular point of view with a particular angle, 
um, and, uh, and at a particular period of time. So you may miss what happened before, you may miss what happens uh, on the side. So it shouldn't be seen as a finite, definite, and unique source of evidence. And the next comment is that I think it's, um, this example is an interesting uh, illustration of the complex interactions between accountability, transparency, uh, trust, and privacy. Because here you have accountability at different levels, actually. You have, of course, the very purpose of the system is accountability of the actions of the police. But then, on the top of this, you have a, a, another type of accountability, which is accountability for the use of the personal data itself, of the of the, of the records. And uh, at the end, uh, I think this can be a win-win situation, but only the case where you have really accountability and transparency of the whole process. And as we've heard before, it's not the case in many cases at least in, in the world. Now, I mean, having said that, I would like to uh, now a ask another question. If we, if we agree that we could accept in certain situations uh, these webcams, or maybe we can them, uh, why stop there? Why, why stop uh, on such a good road? Of course, uh, police officers, they wear weapons, they can inflict harm to people, but there are other professions, other professionals in the same situation. Uh, you have, for example, uh, prison officers, custom control officers, uh, private security staff, uh, public transport staff, and also wear weapons. But going even further, you have uh, professions such as uh, truck drivers, bus drivers, surgeons who can inflict harm and even death to people. Of course, not indirectly, but uh, it could still result from uh, professional misconduct or, or negligence. And if you could go even further, you could say that uh, there are also many professionals which could be it could be intense situations with the public. Um, and I think in particular firefighters uh, in Europe, or at least in France, there are more and more situations in which firefighters are subject to violence because they are associated with the uh, police. But you, have, you can think, of course, of um, ticket controllers, metamates, and so on. And, and going even further, uh, many professionals can be subject to wrong accusations, and in some cases, it can be very serious. Uh, we've heard many cases in, in France and in Europe of, um, of teachers or, or, or professors accused, wrongly accused of pedophilia. In some cases, uh, the, the, the results are, are dramatic. So, of course, as you can see here, we are on uh, quite a, a slippery slope. And uh, especially if you consider one of the arguments of some uh, police officers for um, wearing uh, body cam, they say that everybody today has a mobile phone, everybody uh, is able to, to, to film them, and, and, and it happens more and more often. So their reaction is to say, well, if we are filmed, why shouldn't we be able to also to film ourselves, just to protect ourselves against uh, wrong accusations? But again, many other professionals could say that, and basically any professional in contact with the public. And I could go even further, I could say even any individual and if you think of uh, the dash cams which are used uh, in, the, in, in Russia, it's basically it's exactly for these. People use these dash cams apparently to protect themselves against wrong accusations by their insurance company that they, they would try to, to mislead them. So if you, if you go on, you could say that basically the, 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 the root of this is that uh, Today, you have more and more uh, 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 general expectation that any, any significant event uh, uh, would be, should be recorded. And from an expectation, this could very well become, become a norm. And from a norm, it could become an obligation. Because if you don't do it, uh, there could be evidentiary presumption against you if, you if you cannot show your records. And of course, this would lead to uh, some kind of live learning society with tremendous consequences on every aspect of our life, on uh, social life, of course, psychological, because as you know, we don't behave the same way when we know that we are kids. Um, and this could lead to 
uniformization of behaviors, of um, uh, conformism, and so on. So, is it the kind of society in which we want to live? If not, is it still possible to avoid this um, kind of scenario? And uh, in that case, where to draw uh, the wet line? So, coming back to my initial conclusions about uh, uh, police webcams, I would say maybe I would revise them a bit. I would say yes, maybe, but uh, there should be a continuous assessment of uh, the consequences. And I think a, a long term reflection and debate about the use of webcams uh, and cameras in, in general. Okay, thank you very much. So, little by little, we come uh, closer to the core of the the debate, I think, uh, and in which way we should allow in, in our society that everybody, actually everybody can register everything in the street and, uh, and be connected to a database and immediately store everything uh, that people see, hear, listen to, uh, etc. Uh, but I think that these are also aspects that are <coughs> Yeah, just a little. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. To understand how this technology can add, the camera produces a regime, regime of truth, especially regimes of objectivity and legitimacy. Is it okay like that? Uh, those regimes of truth strongly shape the way we interact together. We, uh, when I say we, mean field humans, as we are a kind of cyborg. I really like this presentation on uh, Donna Haraway's words, which is, a, I, I know if you know her, uh, she's a feminist um, philosopher of technical science studies. Um, last thing to say to introduce my words, this contribution will not be uh, an ethical or a normative assessment about um, body camps, but it's more um, a cartography. Um, a map, uh, tentative, tentative to map a reflection, a kind of cartography of what happened to us with the endless multiplication of cameras connected to late body. Sorry for my um, So, those last days, there were a lot of debates about body cams, use and misuse, risk and, and opportunities. It's strange to see, however, that there are a lot of cameras connected to these bodies, but they are not so controversial. Like smartphones used as camera in any context, at home, at work, during protests, etc. Ultrasound scans, like uh, during pregnancy, to see the fetus from every angle. Google Glass, Twitter Cam, so Twitter Cam, just to show you.
quoting her, I would like to insist to the unmodified nature of all vision, she says. Second, vision is always a question of power to see, and perhaps of the violence, violence implicit in our rapid design, in the way design practices. And allowing, finally, she called vision as a god trick, uh, which promises vision from everywhere and nowhere equally employed. So you, you see that she has a strong position relating uh, to, uh, to the concept of vision. Now we're putting this concept of vision with optical processes. Vision is powerful and unmodified process that produce regional difference. So we have a few examples. Um, the male gaze, I don't know if you all know this concept, but it's a concept from feminist studies. Um, it's a concept from the Laura Lovely, um, she introduced the second great feminist concept of maybe the feature of gender power asymmetry in film. Lovely stated that women were objectified in film because of heterosexual men owning control of the camera. The male gaze occurs when the camera puts the audience into the perspective of a heterosexual men. It may linger over the curves of a woman body, for instance. The woman is usually displayed on two different levels. As an erotic object, for both the character within the film, as well as for the spectator who is watching the film. So the male gaze is a kind of a situated vision. For CCTV, sociological studies show that constant monitoring induces anticipatory conformity in citizen behavior. And finally, we have Kutakam, that I, I show you the, the picture. In her paper, Donna Howey, in a paper of Pelican, Compounding Eye and Natural Culture, which is uh, 2008, she developed the idea that Pelican is supposed to deliver a true and spontaneous digital version of what penguins, waves, or I don't know, live and see and live in reality. So we have three examples. So, how can you define more optical processes? Following my reasoning, I would qualify that as a creation of a specific vision that produces regime of truths, as I would say. Two regimes of truths are engaged here. A regime of objectivity <coughs> at uh, the epistemological level of scientific knowledge, science and technical uh, knowledge. And second, a regime of legitimacy uh, for the epistemological level of proof and, and evidence. Those two um, regimes of truth, objectivity and legitimacy, are supposed to be un un universal and neutral. So they are in the daily life non questionable and all quite questionable. <coughs> they are not so much debate about those kind of regimes of truth. So, following back to my uh, feminist point of view, a uh, universal and neutral regime of truth has been qualified by feminist philosopher as masculine. Masculine individuals or institutions created by these individuals that exert the power to determine what is considered as natural. Over the course of the time, this constructive belief begins to seem natural or normal. Or the norm is, is being like um, Daniel says, because they are prevalent and carry out unchallenged. We can assume the same with the optical process like body cam. So body cam they are, of course, for police, but not only, like uh, Daniel on the line, but for other teachers, surgeons, every people, every person likely to be controlled. It is also a tool, a tool for increasing transparency in law enforcement, or it is also a tool for enhancing trust between community and police, as uh, Obama said. So even politician and manual advice underline uh, the opportunity of body camps. Uh, it is, I quote him, it is moreover an element of irrefutable evidence from the commission's intervention when they are questioned by citizens. So it's right to the debate we had previously. But what about the production of legitimacy and objectivity in police conduct? <coughs> thanks to the digital image and thanks to the police material attachment, Body cam seems to be unavoidable. Images are captured naturally. 
following the body's movement, not anymore with a clear intention and decision of the observer actively moves. Think something with your smartphone, you, you watch for something. It's your body who is um, watching you, not you. Um, not anymore so with the clear intention and decision of the observer. We can underline that a crucial attention is paid to the material side of our humanity. I think this is very important. So two material sides, biological side, body does not lie, and biometrics put it every day, and technological side, optical and cognitive processes become fundamental to fulfill our humanity. So, therefore, I would say that our materiality is a compound of flesh and digital object, and this materiality is also our humanity. Here it is an ontological assumption. Sorry for the few seconds. <laughs> Just a few words, and I will conclude. A few words about body and technology relationship. Don Heather, which is an American philosopher, insisted that in the human technology analytic relation, The technology adapts to the humans and vice versa. Human bodies and technologies cohabit each other in relation to particular projects of life forms. Insofar as I use the technology, I am also used by the technology. Technology shapes us, optical prosthetics strongly shape our vision and strongly shape our bodies. And in conclusion, a few words, a quite, quite ethical in a way. Subjective side, I will conclude so, a few insights about body cams. Subjective sides of human beings are completely neglected. So we, we don't need the subjective side. And so don't the huge responsibility is delegated to optical technology. To produce pretty much of truth and to discuss <coughs> justice. And finally, I just want to underline in this context of security and different projects. I want to underline the huge gap between the public funding of optical and surveillance technologies and the way the daily justice <coughs> is rendered and is funded, for example, in Belgium. Uh, in Belgium, the, the daily justice is completely underfunded. So, in Latin and world, sorry for this, I would ask is this a symptom of what we desire as a just society or a fair society? Thank you very much. You see that uh, from, from a philosopher also come from interesting elements for the debate, yeah. like, like for instance the, the fact that there is a huge difference between filming one with a mobile camera intentionally and we are on it, which is that, that should certainly not not forgotten. We have um, we have ten minutes for the debate. Normally I would. Uh, go through uh, a round with the speakers, but I, I think uh, in 10 minutes it is preferable to go immediately to the audience um, with with three questions. I I, uh, I see three three main questions. The first one, which was dealt mainly by by the first speaker by Jay, is um, is the use of body cam video material in criminal procedures and, and the, the element of possibility to manipulate um, what we call cross contamination of evidence, etc. So there is this debate. Then another debate is in how far you can force certain professionals, policemen, and uh, we learn about firemen, teachers even, etc. to, I could say, to share their eyes and ears <coughs> with, with the database, with, with their uh, hierarchy, etc. So how far can you go in, in forcing people to wear these devices? And that, then, of course, there is the, uh, the much wider debate of, of, um, uh, of the trend that progressively anyone can, can use these devices and, and then become in a situation of what you call permanent life logging, uh, which is, which is uh, perhaps, perhaps a very dangerous situation. And of course, I am, I am a legal person. My, my question is, how should we regulate it? And we have the, uh, 
the proposed data protection regulation? Is it, is it is that, for instance, a regulatory instrument? Together with the directive for law enforcement, are these regulatory instruments that are adequate enough to, uh, to deal with these, with these issues? But uh, someone already uh, wanted to draw. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, Matthias Leser from the University of Tübingen, uh, Germany. Um, I was actually quite relieved that uh, the, the last uh, presentation kind of challenged this, this notion of the truth because um, I got the feeling that the rest of the panel had um, a shared consensus that there was one truth um, that could be un unveiled and um, uh, dragged out of the public um, by producing a video or producing images. Um, and I'm also thinking of Jean Baudrillard here, who has argued that um, with the digital production of images, um, there also comes the possibility to manipulate those images. And um, I think it has also be be, uh, become quite obvious um, that there are certain regulatory challenges in terms of when cameras are switched on, when, uh, where, 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 when they are switched off, um, where they can record, etc. So um, I would encourage the, the rest of the panel to reflect on this um, notion that there is more than one truth, um, maybe, and, and this, uh, it, it might not be that easy um, just to produce a video and then um, have a certain narrative of the truth. <coughs> On this point, I would like to ask Jay, you mentioned the relationship between the body cam today in the United States and the FOIA legislation, which I, I didn't very well understand in, in which way are these things uh, related and, and in which way open records, as you call them, mm -hmm. comes into the debate about it. Can you put it shortly? Yes, so um, on, on the open records, in some states in the United States, all of the footage that is collected by any camera must be released to the public if the public requests, requests it. Or a journalist wants to do a TV show and put embarrassing moments on or anything. Um, because the video that is created is considered a public record, just like the transcript of, a, of, an open, of a public meeting or anything like that. And so that wreaks havoc to the, um, uh, to, the, um, to the proposed regulatory regime to protect privacy that we have proposed, and so we've had to adapt. On your point, I think it's an excellent point. Uh, I think um, uh, there is a lot of naivete about video um, in the general culture, um, that it is an objective record. Any first year film student knows that it's not an objective record. Uh, it depends on you know, angle, lighting, when it starts, when it stops, etc. And that's one of the reasons that we argue police officers should not be able to view uh, their own body camera footage before they write their report because they will have their own subjective, subjective record. The video is a separate subjective record and we should capture both before we allow the two to contaminate each other. Okay, Brendan, I'll start. Yeah, um, yeah, excellent, excellent comment. I thought it was very interesting. And one of the, the things that, that came up when you started talking about the slippery slope um, <clears throat> this, this difference between, I would just say, risk analysis and risk aversion, um, and this this idea that we're basically, we, we're, we, technology is creating a great opportunity for us, and it seems that, especially in certain districts, in five minutes, it's time for another session. Okay. Districts like, uh, you know, certain areas in the United States, um, there, there's, there's a real problem with police violence and police brutality. Uh, but what's troubling me was that there's not a lot of data which actually is there to justify the need for increased surveillance across the United States. Is that in metropolitan areas? Is, is Detroit performing worse than New Jersey? Like, I mean, there, it seems like there's, we don't just need accountable use of the technology once it's put out there. We also need greater accountability in the decision to introduce it. That makes sense. So throw that out there. Yeah. We have almost to stop. There are two or three other people who wanted to go just please. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark Fraser from the Association of Chief Police Officers. Can you can speak loud? Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, I'm going to yes. yes. um, First of all, I was really saddened to hear that you struggled to get anybody from the police um, side of this at the very beginning. Um, but I'm happy just to give a very brief context in respect to the UK. Um, we tend to call it body worn video uh, and BWB. So, BWB has been used um, to varying extents throughout the UK, um, both within forces and across the country. It's nothing new. Uh, and yes, it is used for accountability, uh, which ties into the issues over integrity, 
and they recently introduced the Code of Ethics that all police officers signed up to, um, as well as evidential value and building trust um, with the community. As I say, we've been using it for several years, but there have been concerns about privacy and the impacts of this in the criminal past. Um, there was a party brought or a group brought together between the Home Office and the Police Service um, specifically to look at developing national guidance on the deployment of PWB and also on the use of the data. Um, and it looked at exactly one of these issues about context. You know, if you switch on, at one point, if you don't have that context, then you don't. It shows a very different picture. So all that was considered. Um, privacy impact assessment that was done to try to build in the privacy concerns as well. So it is something in the governance side uh, that we do take extremely seriously in the UK. So it's just to try and get that perspective. And we do accept the concerns that the public have over being filled uh, in appropriate Okay, thank you. One last person, Christos. Well, that's an excellent time. I have a question to Jim. You talk about like, the wild west because there are no like real policies within the United States that provide what to do and how to you know properly do surveillance and you know society. I mean I think the United States is not alone. Everywhere in Latin America perhaps it's the same in some parts of Europe as well. So what's the American government? What's the role of the for instance of the organization to make the government accountable and to implement certain policies in order to <coughs> to make this surveillance less borders for the general citizens? So, um, you know, the ACLU is a large organization. Um, we have 600 employees. We have uh, lobbyists in all the state capitals um, and affiliates in every state. And we, um, we use the media to push out the message that, you know, that this is going to be done, it has to be done right, or it's going to be bad, it's like good. Um, and a lot of the police departments are reaching out to our local um, Local representatives and asking and consulting with them as they as they formulate policies and we're pushing them to have policies that will eliminate the problems we've discussed today. Um, and so you know we're doing the best we can in a, in a vast, far flung country where it is there's no overarching data rules or you know regulations. And, um, and so uh, we use all the tools that we, at our disposal. A lot of what we do is, is litigation, but that's is, there's no grounds for litigation because there's no laws on which to base lawsuits. Okay, we I think we have to uh, stop here. I I. Uh